Well, hey, Crossroads, how's everybody doing? Doing okay? All right. I just want to say uh, thanks for joining us here uh, in the room at the South Campus, and thanks for those joining us online. Glad you are uh, tuning in and worshiping with us uh, wherever you find yourself. Uh, I want to say it's been quite a week here at Crossroads. Uh, a lot of cool things happening. God's on the move. We had uh, our uh, camps for our middle school and high school students this past week. We had almost 200 students. Uh, God was moving. It was a little bit different than previous years because everything was social distancing and different location. But you know what? It's the same God, and God does what he always does. And there was breakthrough moments for those middle school and high school students, so many cool things. In addition to that, our servant ministries team uh, partnered with the rescue mission, and we were able to provide uh, free shoes, new shoes, uh, to students that were going back to school who otherwise couldn't uh, have new shoes. So there's going to be uh, students going back with uh, some pride and you know, some new kicks, and they're excited about that. So we're so honored to be able to partner and make that happen. Uh, we took some big steps forward with our North Campus uh, remodel. Um, thanks to some of you showing up and busting out some, some plaster and some things like that. Thanks for those of you that did that. Uh, we were able to host the funeral for a Crossroads member, Elaine Buchanan, and hear how God used her life to impact so many over her years of teaching and serving in churches, and um, it's just a cool experience. And then you saw firsthand the life change that had happened in four people's lives as they took the next step with Christ through baptism last Sunday, and that's all just in one week, right? I think that's worth celebrating, right? Yes, listen, God is on the move, and we can become so focused on the negative and the news stories and all this and miss it, but God's moving. Ain't no pandemic going to stop Jesus, right? Yes, amen, and that's what this next series we're talking about in two weeks is all about. God has called his people to be resilient. The church is not going to fail. It's going to thrive, and we're going to be talking about how you can join in and the things that God is calling his people to do uh, to be resilient. So I would encourage you this week to begin praying about who can you invite in two weeks to join you for the start of that new series, whether say, hey, come, come to church with me, or to say, hey, you might want to tune in online. Uh, but this can be a great opportunity to, to bring somebody in. Somebody needs to know the hope, uh, how to thrive in the midst of all the stuff that's going on. Well, this week, uh, we're continuing our series we're calling Walk This Way, talking about how do we walk in the way of Jesus? How do we live that out in our lives? Uh, and I'm talking about the promises of God. How do we walk in God's promise? Anybody, when they were growing up, do a, a pinky promise? Anybody ever do that growing up? I grew up calling it a pinky swear, uh, but my kids tell me, no, it's pinky promise, Dad, and uh, I guess we just do things differently in Clinton County. But um, pinky promise, right? Wait, pinky promise is the highest level of assurance that when you're a kid, you can give. Like, no, listen, I'm going to do what I'm saying I'm going to do. I pinky promise it, right? Well, for God, his pinky promise has a name. The highest level of assurance in his promises. In the Bible, it's called a covenant. A covenant. So we're going to talk about covenants today. And there's a lot of nuances to the idea of a covenant. Uh, if you want to do a deep dive into that, you can. We don't have time for that today. But for the sake of just kind of a common understanding, I would describe a covenant this way. That a covenant is a promise from God. This is pinky promise. This is highest assurance. Promise from God. Inviting faithful partnership with him. And here's the heart of a covenant. It's all about relationship. It's about partnership. So God's saying, hey, I'm going to do this stuff. But he makes his promises not in a vacuum. The reason he makes them is for his people, for his people to be in confidence and, and trust in him. And it's about this relationship uh, that, that they work together in. And so as you read through Scripture, there's um, some uh, covenants that are conditional. In other words, God says, hey, I will do this as long as you do this. Other covenants that God makes with his people are unconditional. No matter what his people do, he's going to keep his, his, his promise and, and go through that. So today, I want to walk through some covenants. We're going to hop, skip, and jump through Scripture and uh, help have an understanding. Because I think understanding how some of these covenants flow together helps you have a better understanding of a biblical story. And then we'll talk about how does that live out practically uh, in our life as well. So we're going to hop, skip, and jump through here. Um, I'm not going to take a ton of time to get into the, the Scripture references, but if you want to know the Scriptures for these covenants, you can look on the uh, online bulletin, the digital bulletin, and those script, Scripture references uh, are all there. So uh, as we go through, I'm going to go through quick, hang in there, listen quickly. Uh, if your eyes glaze over, that's okay. Uh, but uh, it, it may be helpful to kind of place some of these things in the context, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get going here to bring some understanding. Okay, you guys ready? All right, we'll start 
where everyone should start in the beginning. So God creates the earth and then places this guy named Adam in the garden. And we're told that he places Adam uh, in the garden to tend it and to care for it. In other words, the reason he created Adam was to be in relationship with him, to be his partner. Adam was to be God's partner in bringing about God's goodness and flourishing on the earth. Right, that idea of partnership, of relationship in a covenant. Uh, and God places Adam in there, and he says, hey, Adam, you can have anything in this garden is yours. This, this ma- the vast expanse, all this is yours, except don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That tree symbolized Adam's ability to not choose God. Because any real relationship has to be voluntary, right? The other person out of free will has to choose to enter into that. And if there's no, no way for us to, to say no to God, then, then we're just kind of like robots. So that tree in the garden symbolized Adam's ability to, to turn from God. Well, as you read through Scripture, you see that Adam and Eve do just that. They eat from that tree. Uh, they, they sin. It severs this partnership that God wanted to have, this relationship that God wanted to have with mankind. And it brought sin and brokenness into the world, much of what we look around today, and we see the ramifications of that. So, uh, as you read through Scripture, then, um, the story continues, and you see humanity kind of taking this, like, downward cycle of moving more and more and more towards evil, more and more and more against God and how He created them to be. And it comes to a place where uh, God wants to start over. And he starts over with a guy named Noah. And so he brings a flood to cleanse uh, the earth, to kind of start over through Noah, this righteous man. And uh, as the flood waters subside and Noah's on the ark, God sends uh, a rainbow and makes a covenant with Noah. And the covenant is this, that he promises to never destroy the world again with a flood. And the covenant's not just with Noah, but with all of creation, the entire world. God makes this promise, this covenant with them. Now, the interesting thing, as you read through Scripture, is, is you read about this covenant that God seals with Noah, and then the very next paragraph in Scripture talks about Noah failing to live God's way, and it creates all this chaos and problems in his family. Then along comes uh, a guy named Abraham. So God calls Abraham... Uh, to, to follow him and it makes a covenant with Abraham where he gives him a promise saying, you know what, Abraham, uh, through your descendants, I'm going to make a nation and they will be a blessing to every family on the earth. Now, this is an interesting promise that God makes with Abraham because at the time he made this promise, Abraham and his wife Sarah were well into old age and they had been unable to have a child. And so Abraham's like, what nation? We don't even have a kid right now, right? But God's faithful to his promises uh, Abraham and child have, or Abraham and Sarah have a child, uh, and through that, in a couple of generations, comes the nation of Israel. Through Abraham comes this this nation, and as you wrap up the story in Genesis, you see that this nation of Israel, that's supposed to be a blessing to all the families in the earth, actually becomes enslaved in Egypt. Which brings the question: How can we be a blessing if we're slaves? So God brings about somebody else, brings about a man named Moses to lead his people into freedom, out of slavery in Egypt, into the promised land. And as Moses leads them, uh, God establishes another covenant with Moses and with all of the the nation of Israel. Uh, This is uh, um, the covenant of his law. Uh, So he says, hey, you are my people, and this is how I want you to uh, live out your life. This is the ways that I want you to live to set yourself apart and to represent me to the world around you. So he gives Moses a series of laws and series of sacrifices, all these things to to do, uh, and then he gives this covenant. But this covenant is a conditional covenant. He says, if you obey my commands, you will be my holy nation. You will be my people. In other words, if you do this, if you do what I'm commanding you to be, uh, be what I'm commanded you to be, then I will bless you and I will use you and you'll be my people. Well, Moses comes down and right after he comes down, we see Israel failing to live this out. Immediately they turn and begin worshiping other idols and turn against God. Are you sensing a theme here in Scripture? God makes a promise and a covenant and his people fail time and time again to hold their end of the partnership. 
Well, the nation of Israel continues on and, and grows, and there's a period of judges, and then they establish a, a kingdom and brings about a guy named David. God establishes a covenant with David, saying, David, through your descendants, uh, someone will always be on the throne. So one of your descendants will always reign on the throne. Now, this is an interesting promise because literally David's grandkids then come in and they split the kingdom. And almost like a, a civil war splits into two, the northern kingdom, kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And it creates this cycle of let's follow God and let's turn from God. Let's repent and go back to God, and then we'll go astray and turn from God. And this cycle over and over and over again, and eventually it leads to, this, to the demise of both kingdoms. The northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, Assyria comes in and destroys them. The kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, Babylon comes in and destroys its temple, destroys Jerusalem, and takes the best and brightest, hauls them off to Babylon, and things are left in ruins. And the people are saying, wait a minute, God, I thought you promised that one of his descendants would reign on the throne forever. How can we reign on the throne when the throne is in pieces? It's a time of great despair for the people of Israel. But in the midst of all of this, God gives some glimpses of a future hope to some prophets. One of those prophets is named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says this. He says, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. The covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt. He's talking about Moses. Uh, he said, they broke that covenant, right? They failed to live up to their end of the deal. Even though they failed to do that, I love them as a husband loves his wife. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel in those days. And he goes on, he says, I will put my instructions deep within them, write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. The very thing he was wanting to do up here. This glimpse, this, this future hope of this new covenant coming that will, will allow God and the people to be united together again and not be separated uh, by, by the sin and brokenness, the broken partnership uh, that had kind of entered the world through Adam. So there's a glimmer of hope. But year after year after year, still nothing that happens with the new covenant. Israel eventually is, it comes out of exile, and they're able to establish a, a little bit of a, a kingdom again, and still no new news of a new covenant. 400 years pass, and this time another superpower comes in and takes control of Israel. This time it's Rome, and people are wondering, God, what about these promises? Where is this? What's this thing that Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel looked forward to and talked about? Where, what's happening here? And that sets the stage for a man named Jesus. Jesus comes onto the scene and begins teaching and performing miracles and doing insane things that gave a glimpse to the people around him that, hey, maybe, maybe this is the guy. Maybe this is the Messiah that we're looking for. Maybe this is the guy that brings about this new covenant. In fact, Jesus... Right before he was arrested and crucified, he's in the upper room with his disciples doing the Last Supper. And in Luke 22, uh, this is what he says. He takes the cup and he says, this is the cup of the what? The new covenant. Ding, 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 ding. Any good Jewish person would hear those words, think back to the promise of Jeremiah and say, whoa, wait a minute, what? This is the cup of the new covenant. Jesus is saying he is bringing in this, this new promise, this new covenant, this new way that God is going to connect with his people. How is he going to do it? It's going to be an agreement confirmed with his blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So Jesus' sacrifice institutes this whole new covenant, this new promise from God. Now, well, what, about, what about all these others? What about these other promises? I want to pause right here for a second, and I want to point something out to you. Do you notice how the covenants start broad and, and get narrow in focus? They, they, they start kind of wide, right? Like with Noah, the covenant was with all of creation, the entire world. Uh, with Abraham, it was through his family, but every family in the world would be blessed. But then Moses, it narrows a little bit. It's, the covenant was just with the nation of Israel, and then with David, it's just with, with his family line focused on a throne. 
It's almost like all these covenants are, are leading to something, are, are funneling to something, right? Funneling to Jesus, to the new covenant. And the followers of Jesus un- began to understand this, and they began to connect the dots to Jesus' teachings, and they realized that God's not just kind of willy-nilly trying to be like, um, let's try this and see if this works. Nope, that failed. Uh, how about this one? Let's try that. Oh, nope, that failed. No, God had had a plan all along, and this plan led to this moment right here, this new covenant. And they understood that Jesus not only institutes a new covenant, but Jesus actually is the fulfillment of every other covenant that God established. Jesus fulfills and makes complete all these others. Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians. He says, for all of God's promises, all his previous promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. So through Jesus brings the ultimate cleansing of the world that God wanted to do. Jesus is the true seed of Abraham, and through him, all the families, everyone in the world will be blessed. Jesus is the only one that was able to keep all of the law, every requirement. Jesus is the only one to do that and fulfill that, those um, commands. Jesus is uh, the true seed of David that will sit on the throne forever. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these. And so Paul and the, the early church began to understand this, and then they began to live out the teachings of Jesus. And as you read through the New Testament, you see that the teachings of Jesus are spread in ever-expanding circles, right? So the church begins to live this out, and what they start as just a movement among Jewish people, God opens their eyes and says, nope, this is for Gentiles too. And then they begin to to spread out, and Paul takes it on his missionary journeys and spreads all throughout the Roman Empire, planting churches, planting churches. It's expanding. And then we read in Revelation 7 that at the feet of Jesus, every tongue, every tribe, every nation will worship him. That sounds an awful lot like this covenant that God made with Abraham that all the families of the earth will be blessed through him, doesn't it? And then we go on and, and we read uh, in, in Revelation 21. We read that the, the new Jerusalem comes, heaven coming to earth, and it says, now God's dwelling place is with his people. Well, that sounds an awful like what he's trying to do here in the garden. As you read through the story of Scripture, you have to understand that all of the Old Testament leads up to Jesus. And then all of the New Testament flows out of what Jesus has done. And so at the centerpiece, the focal piece of the biblical story is what Jesus has done, instituting the new covenant. Jesus is the centerpiece. Jesus changes everything in the biblical story. It hinges upon it. And I believe Jesus can change everything in your story, that your story hinges upon what Jesus has done. It's like, okay, Brent, that's kind of cool, some biblical knowledge there. What does that mean for me? Right? What about my life? Let's talk a little bit about new covenant. I want to talk through three ways that walking in God's promise of a new covenant, uh, how, how that looks in our life. Because I think part of the problem for many of us is uh, we have just enough understanding of the church. We've been in church just long enough, um, and we kind of live here. But God created us to live here in a new covenant. So let me, let me explain. Three ways that walking in the new covenant uh, it impacts you and the promise of the new covenant. The first one is this, that uh, we can walk in confidence. We can walk in confidence. So what Jesus uh, did, he made a way for us, right? Just like he was talking about, the new covenant made possible by his sacrifice through his blood on the cross. And the thing that separated us from God, the thing that wreaked all the havoc up here, the sin that enters the world is now taken care of. And all of the, the, the mistakes and failures and sin that you and I have had in our life have been cleansed and forgiven and taken care of by what Jesus did on the cross 
Listen to what um, the writer in Hebrews talks about this. And the writer in Hebrews talks a lot about comparing the sacrifices of the old covenant to uh, what Jesus has done in his sacrifice in the new covenant. He says this, for God's will was for us to be made holy. For us to be made holy. How? By obeying all the laws? By doing all the right things? By checking off all the boxes? No, we fail time and time again to do that. How are we going to be made holy? By the sacrifice in the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all time. Once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priests stand and ministers before day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sin. So, so he's pointing out the, the inability of the old covenant to, to make us holy. He says, but our high priest, talking about Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. So because of that, you can now walk in confidence. So many people I talk to, are, are, they don't know where they stand with God. Right? They're like, I don't, I don't know, you know, like I asked him to forgive these sins, but this morning I stubbed my toe and I cussed, but I haven't asked him to forgive me for that yet. And I don't, look, sacrifice once for all time. So all of your sin and mistakes and failures in the past have been taken care of. But not only that, everything you will do in your entire life in the future has been taken care of by the blood of Christ once for all time. So you can now stand in confidence. You can walk in confidence with God knowing that you are secure in him. That when he looks at you through Christ, he sees you as holy and perfect and dearly loved. You don't have to wonder and be wishy-washy. Like, I don't know. I think I've done enough good for God to approve of me. I don't know where I stand. No. The new covenant, what Jesus has done, is a game changer in how we walk out our faith we walk in confidence. We walk in confidence. So I have kids at my house, and their house is always a bit of a mess, toys everywhere. And there's so many times that I have to walk through my house, not careful not to step on any Legos or action figures, right? But every once in a while on a blue moon, we can motivate our kids and we'll get things picked up. And then, then it's like, oh, I can walk through my house in confidence. I don't have to worry about where I'm going. I don't have to worry about what I'm stepping on. And that's what we're talking about here. God wants us to live our life in firm confidence of his love for you. It's that song we sang out, that he's for you. He's for you. He's for you. We repeat it over and over and over again because some of us need it driven into our heart. What Jesus has done is paved a way and removed the thing that separated us from God. So now we can be united with him. So anything you've ever done is forgiven. Anything you ever will do will be forgiven. You say, well, what, what about, you know, man, this week I fell back into my addiction, and I, I just don't know how God can accept me. That's like the fifth time I've struggled with that. Well, where's God in that? It's forgiven. You've been made holy. You say, well, what about, I, man, last night I was on the computer, and I stumbled, and I looked at some things I shouldn't look at. I don't know. I don't know if God can take me back. He sees you as holy. It's taken care of. Now, the problem is for, for those of us living here, like that's a little uncomfortable. And what about the rules? <laughs> what, about, what about the rules that we're supposed to do? And then there's a guy like me saying, it's forgiven. It's wiped clean. But that's just half the gospel. yes. Christ's sacrifice removed all of our sin, but it's not a blank check just to do whatever you want. Be like, oh, it'll be forgiven. Well, that's, that's paid for. That's paid for. That's paid for. No big deal. Remember I said at the beginning, the covenant is all about relationship and partnership. So the reason for Christ's sacrifice was to remove the things that separate us from God so we can have an intimate relationship with our creator. So we can walk in confidence and that paves the way then for us to walk in God's spirit, God's presence guiding us and leading us in what we do. 2 Corinthians 3.6, Paul writes this. He says, the old written covenant ends in death. This covenant ends in death because we can't, we can't fail. We can fail every time to keep all of the, the rules, all the commands. But under the new covenant, the spirit gives life. So when, when you place your faith and trust in Christ, we believe the Holy Spirit fills you, brings life to you, 
And then he continues on uh, in the same chapter, and he says, And the Lord, who is the Spirit, this is the job of the Holy Spirit after you accept Christ, to make us more and more like him. As we're changed into his glorious image, so we can be changed into the people he created us to be. When, when sin and all of our failures and all our shortcomings have, have marred our soul and distorted us, then God's presence fills us and changes us to be more and more like who he created us to be. And so the whole reason of Christ's sacrifice to wipe away all your sin is to pave the way for God's presence to be in you and to guide you. He talked about the, the old covenant, the written law leading to death and the new covenant bringing life. You can think of it in this way. Think of the, the old covenant as, uh, as like an electric fence. Right? I, I grew up uh, raising livestock, and in our pasture, it was surrounded with an electric fence. And you had to be careful. I was out doing my chores, and if I wasn't paying attention to how close I was to the fence, <laughs> right? Sometimes for fun, I would have my friends come over, and I would grab their hand and grab the fence. <laughs> Just to, just to see uh, if they're paying attention, right? Well, listen, that's kind of how the, the job of the law was to, to point out our need for a Savior, right? It was like, you cross the line, boom. You cross the line, boom. And Paul talks about that in, 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 in some of his letters. He talks about how the job of the law was to point our need for a Savior to Jesus. The Spirit, the new covenant, operates not like an electric fence, but more like a compass, leading you and guiding you, pointing you to true north. This is the direction that God has called his people to go. This is what he, how he wants you to live and what he wants you to do. It's kind of the difference between, between those two things. And so God's spirit leading us and guiding us so we can walk in confidence, we can walk in his spirit, and what that does then is that paves the way for us to walk in a new heart. And if you don't get anything about the new covenant, I want you to get this. The new covenant is all about God working from the inside out. The old covenant was focused on the outside in. Do all these things. Obey all these laws. Do all this stuff, and then you'll be my people. This is, no. God's going to change our heart. He's going to lead us and guide us, and then we'll become more and more and more like him. One of the prophets uh, around the time of Jeremiah that God gave a glimpse of this, this new covenant, this new promise coming, was the prophet Ezekiel. And uh, listen to what he talks about with our hearts. He says, I will give you a new heart, and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then he goes on, he says, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So it's not that these don't matter, it's just that we can never do these on our own. And the only way for us to, to truly be God's people is for a heart change to happen and for God's presence to fill us to begin to transform us, and then we will begin walking and begin, you'll find that you will just naturally, out of response to what God has done for you and what he's doing in you, you will begin to walk in the way he's created you to walk, and you'll begin to, to from the inside out, begin keeping his laws and his decrees. Catch what we're talking about here? It's a totally different paradigm, and it changes how you live your life. For, so for my kids, and maybe those of you with kids, right, uh, it's easy as parents to, to slip into the mindset that what we want from our kids is obedience. I want you to do what I say, right? Because we know what's best for them. And it, if I'm not careful, I can become an authoritarian dad, and I can just drive into my kids like, do what I say, do what I say, do what I say. And if I'm mean enough, and if I use my dad voice loud enough, I can instill enough fear and give the punishments and ground them, then they, they kind of begin to obey. And I feel like I'm such a great dad, right? Until they leave my house. And they don't have dad looking over their shoulder anymore. Then they just kind of do whatever they want. <laughs> no, I think a better approach is to capture their heart and to build a relationship with them and to say, this is who you are and this is how we operate in our family. And this is why and, and Work with that so that whatever context they find themselves in, then they have self-control and, and they can make the right choices, but it flows from the inside out, not from the outside in. The same is true in our relationship with God. And so my, my fear for, for many of us, uh, and I'm, I'm talking us as in our culture, our broader culture, 
is that we're, we're just Christian enough, like, like people have had just enough exposure to the church. Maybe they, grandma took them to Sunday school, or you spent a couple times in a youth group, or whatever, that you begin to, to hear a wrong gospel. And I think so many people in our culture today, in north central Indiana, follow the gospel of behavior modification. And they think that the church is just about helping you be good. And we have a list of the do's and the don'ts, right? Do say this word, don't say this word. Do wear these clothes, don't wear this clothes. Do watch this movie, don't watch this movie. Do and don't, do and don't. And, and, and it, they can, that message can suddenly come in and they think like, okay, well, it's all about being a good person and my life's screwed up. <laughs> I'm not a good person at all, so I, I can't come to church. There's no way that God would accept me or like Right? You ever talk to those people like, oh, if I step into the foot of a church, then God will send a lightning bolt down, right? They're, they're, they're operating here. They're operating under the idea of this gospel of behavior modification that God just wants our obedience. Well, he does, but it, it doesn't come from the outside in. It's not about what we do. Right? You look through the checklist of do this and don't do that and do this and don't do that, and Jesus says, done. It's already done for you. So now all you have to do then is just give me your heart. Let me put a new heart in you. Take that heart of stone out. Let me give you a new heart. So my question is, where's your heart today? Where's your heart today? It could be that as you listen to this, uh, you're in a position where uh, you've never, never taken that first step to say, Jesus, here's my heart. Right? And maybe some of the things I'm talking about, maybe something clicked for the first time for you. Or maybe you're like, well, that's interesting. I'd like to talk about that more. Maybe this morning is an opportunity for you to say, okay, I don't understand all this, God, but I'm, I'm going to give you my heart. And I, I want you to, to work on me from the inside out. And I, I'm going to choose to trust you. And, and I want to try to follow you. And I need your help to do that. Here, here's my heart. Maybe for you, that's the first time. Maybe for others of us, you're like me. And as life goes on and things get crazy, you can become so inward focused and you don't even realize that over time your heart begins to harden. And you can slip into that mindset that it's all about the do's and the don'ts and then you can look around and look at other people and start to judge them. Be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing that. How stupid are they? Oh my God. Right? And sometimes our heart can just kind of become hardened and we forget the beauty of the gospel, of what Jesus has done for us. And so maybe for you today, it's an opportunity to say, God, I, you have my heart, but I've kind of let it get hard. And, and I just want to give it back to you to give me a heart of flesh. Where's your heart today? The power of the promise of the new covenant is that we can walk in confidence we can walk with God's Spirit guiding us. And we can walk with Him taking our heart and transforming it so that from the inside out, we can reflect His goodness to the world around us. That's what it's about. And it's nothing that we can do on our own. We can't earn it. We can't perform our way there. We can't do the right check boxes. The only check box we can do is our heart. Say, so God's here from the heart. So where's your heart today? And what may be, be the next step that God is asking you to take to continue to walk in the way of Jesus. So if you would, let's pray. And I'm going to ask you, if you feel comfortable, just to take your hands and hold them out in front of you, just symbolically saying, here's my heart, Lord. I'm giving you my heart. So Jesus, we give you our hearts today. God, for those that are choosing to do this, maybe for the first time, I pray that they would experience your presence in their life. They would sense you. And God, that you would begin to work in them and open their eyes to the beauty of who you are, the desire that you have to have a relationship with them. God, for those of us maybe offering our hearts again to you and realizing that we've kind of become hardened with all the challenges and circumstances we've been been facing and the chaos in the world, God, we've kind of retreated away. We would say, no, no, God, here's my heart. We give it to you. 
So God, we ask you to work. Do what only you can do. And God, those of us, those of us holding onto our hearts with clenched fists, sitting with our arms crossed, keep working on us, God. That you still love us and you're just waiting for us to say, here's our heart. And God, I pray for, for conversations to happen, for people to, to be led into situations where they can talk about this. And ultimately, God, we pray that we can walk in confidence, that we can walk with your presence guiding us, and we can walk as you transform us from the inside out, so you receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray.